Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Today, we're at Chapter 18, Unnatural Causes. Where we last left off, we found out who, ha who um, Little Pip's secret admirers should be. And I'm really excited what to find out next. So, I'm curious. At um, Homage's little uh, thing for... I gotta stop talking like that. What just happened? I'm not gonna ask. Anyway, let's get to, um... Sorry, it's just my TV just flickered on and off for some reason. It's not ghosts. But anyway, do not call the Winchesters. Oh. Finally, I had found another mayor whom I respected and admired, and who respected, and maybe even admired, me in return. One who was attracted to mayors, and who I could believe was at least a little physically attracted to me. We weren't in love. We barely knew each other. But there was the possibility of her love. There was, in a word, hope. The last sixteen hours had made for a very long day. As much as I would have loved to spend the next several hours with homage, she'd realized straight away that I was in no shape for anything but sleep. So she sent me off back to my suite, where Velvet Remedy had puttered and tisked about my wounds until I had fallen into a dreamless sleep out of sheer exhaustion. I woke up very late in the morning hungry, and for more than just food. Velvet Remedy had already awoken and disappeared to the shops to get the best caps for everything Calamity had decided to swipe from the ruins of the Red Racer factory in the Ministry of Morale hub. Most of what Velvet and I had scavenged was intended for our own uses, food and ammo, mostly, as well as the poison glands I cut out of the manicores. After what she had been through, I had decided to allow the Sea Blue Pony to keep my poison dart gun. I had everything needed to create another one once we returned home. Calamity had seen to the purchase of a workstation, currently very disassembled, which he would install at Junction R7 when we arrived. Which, thanks to the part needed to repair the Skyband, shouldn't be more than a few days. I wasn't about to leave until I had a chance to spend... quality time with homage. Out of more than curiosity, I tuned my pit buck to DJ Pony's station and listened to the music playing while I cleaned and groomed myself. Homage had already begun to integrate the new music into DJ Pony's playlists, that unusually upbeat song about mending friendships with Amage and I had danced to was playing while I cleaned my teeth and tried to work all the tangles out of my mane and tail. Hoorah! DJ Pony's voice thundered over the airwaves as the song ended. Celestia and Luna bless us, we have new music! And with new music comes some new news. Ready for this? Last night, our wasteland savior. My telekinesis imploded, dropping everything I was floating. That kid from Stable 2 found and rescued the good folks of Gutterville. And what whore did she save them from, you ask? A psychotic ghoul scientist who was performing experiments with Taint and who had bred himself a small army of manicores. That, folks, is what they mean by crushing two rad roaches with one hoof. She not only saved the lives of over two dozen ponies, but she solved Manhattan's manticore problem, too. I dropped my head into the sink, letting out a whimpering sigh. My reputation was totally out of control. I barely heard the door to the suite open as I anguished over what ponies would be thinking of and expecting of me now. Part of me swore so Amish just liked making water. me squirm. Hell, you see the kid? Tell her to stop by and visit. Old DJ Pony wants to give her a big kiss for that one. My head shot up, catching my horn painfully on the faucet. Ow! You do know there are more civilized ways to get a drink of water than slurping it out of the sink, right? Velvet Remedy's voice rang out from the other room. Wincing, I touched my horn, looking at myself in the mirror, then turned to Velvet. She was pulling a small red wagon behind her, loaded with supplies and dresses. I stared at the rather fancy and elegant gowns. I thought we'd want to look our best for DJ Pony, she stated simply. Crap. I'd forgotten about Velvet Remedy's impending addition. Don't worry, I know you're sized. I've wrapped you in bandages often enough that I ought to. I felt myself blushing. Velvet Remedy floated a pair of dresses, both simple yet graceful, towards me. They look perfect on you. Trust me. The one on the right will really bring out your eyes, and the one on the left will beautifully complement your mane and tail. Which one should I wear, then? Up to you. Or, if you want to be mysterious, both. Find an excuse to step out and change halfway through the evening. Velvet Remedy smiled brightly. Go on. Take them. A girl can never have too many dresses. I nodded, floating them onto my bed with care, then jumped and gave Velvet Remedy a big hug. Thank you. 
Oh, think nothing of it, dear. She whinnied kindly. Velvet Remedy was expecting to meet DJ Pony. I needed to talk with Amage and find out how she wanted to handle this. If Amage was willing to reveal herself to me, trusting me with such a big secret, then it stood to reason she would be equally willing in regard to my friends. Part of me, however, didn't want her to. I wanted it to remain our little secret, just Amage and I, something special between us. I wanted her not to want to trust any other pony, not even Velvet Remedy with such a gift. It was a selfish thought. I knew I should be ashamed of myself for having it. But I consoled myself that this was Amage's secret to tell or keep, so the fact that I was keeping it from my friends was an act of virtue. On the way to the elevator, I passed a poster. Pinkie Pie, it insisted, was still watching me. Forever. Not On the out. opposite wall was a poster of Fluttershy, this time not modeling for Sparkle Cola, but an actual poster of her own ministry. War, fear, death, we must do better, Ministry of Peace. We must do better. We should be better. I should be better. I understood why Velvet Remedy loved that yellow Pegasus pony. If only there had been more like her. Then the equestrian wasteland may never have been. I was still contemplating the poster when Amwood stepped out of the elevator. Her face brightened as she spotted me. Ah, just the toast to repair pony I was looking for. I would never live that one down. Homage, I breathed, feeling my heart flutter a bit as I fully drank in the fact that this pretty gray unicorn with the vibrant blue mane actually had feelings for me. Possibly romantic feelings. Or at least she was willing to entertain the idea of them. That alone was more than I'd ever had from a mare before, and from a mare whom I really liked. And he was cute, too. Yes, she said playfully, making me stammer. I, um, I... That is, we, uh, when and how did you want to do the thing at the place? The thing at the place? I waved a hoof in flustered exasperation. You know, uh, Velvet Remedy, DJ Pony, recording her music. Oh, Amage grinned. That thing at that place. You trust her, right? The ponies of Ten Pony Tower know me as DJ Pony's errand girl, but I can't really let it go out that I'm a bit closer to him than that. She can keep a secret. Part of me hated sharing the truth about homage, but it would be wrong not to. Forever. You are DJ Pony? Homage smiled, clearly enjoying Velvet Remedy's disbelief. Velvet Remedy had made herself up gorgeously and donned one of her new dresses, a stunning purple number, all with the intention of making a breathtaking first impression. Now she was shooting me cross glances. I've got the whole recording studio in here, so the recording will be as good as you are, Amage said, stepping between us as she spoke to Velvet. I found myself staring at Amage's flanks, covered with a silky silver dress that sparkled as it clung so tightly to. Velvet was looking at me. She'd caught me staring, and the little smile on her face made my heart sink. I'd be lucky if the rest of our travels weren't to the soundtrack of Little Piven Homage sitting in an apple tree. Homage gave Velvet Remini a much abbreviated tour, skipping the roof and the Athenium altogether, but showing off the small recording studio that exited off the MAS EBS. Okay, okay, I'm gonna stop right now. Velvet looked like she I like how they're just like really. Uh, I'm sorry, but this is really pushing those two together right now. I can just imagine the, just the things that are just going on is in her head. Both her heads. Everyone's heads. I, I, I could just see it. I could see it. And, oh, oh god, I'm so glad I got the rest of the day off for this. Oh. She was in heaven. No matter how much she protested, no matter how much she longed to be a medical pony, the only one Velvet could hope to convince that she didn't get unparalleled joy from singing was Velvet herself. As Velvet Remedy entered the studio chamber, Homage turned her attention to the recording equipment, waving her horn over a desk of switches and dials. Rows of colorful lights lit up in response. I was left to sit in a corner and watch the show. Velvet Remedy approached the microphone. Sound check. Do you hear me clearly, DJ? What should I call you? Homage when we're together, the gray unicorn replied. I felt a completely irrational twinge of jealousy at the mention of them and together. I clopped my forehead. Such feelings were as unbecoming as they were ridiculous. Stop being a silly pony, little Pip, I whispered to myself under my breath. This is an amazing setup, homage, Velvet admired. Then, almost too casually, she asked, 
Would you happen to have a workbench anywhere around here? Amwaj looked up from the recording desk. Yes. Why? Oh, good. Little Pip has a project she needs a private workspace for, Velvet Remedy claimed. Now I felt really stupid for having felt that involuntary twinge. Even on the verge of giving a performance that would be heard equestria-wide, Velvet Remedy was still thinking about helping me. I suspect the project will take her all night, Velvet purred conspiratorially. Oh, God. It's all right if she spends the night with you, isn't it? Solar flaring orgasms of Celestia. Solar flaring oh, orgasms? Oh, well, I'd love to chat what? too. Solar flaring orgasms of Equestria. That is the weirdest curse I've heard so far. Like, what the fuck? Ah! And sorry, my phone keeps going off. My phone is connected to the my YouTube thing, so it tells me all the YouTube notifications and shit. So, sometimes it gets annoying, but hey. Purred how much back. Entertain her for a night? I was doomed. Ready when you are. Velvet Remedy's horn began to glow. The recording chamber filled with colorful yeah. light and rich electric music. Homage was struck with awe. I smiled, knowing the impact of a Velvet Remedy performance. <sighs> music is my remedy. Four hours later, Homage and I strolled the mall of Ten Pony Tower. Velvet Remedy had been amazing. At her insistence, Amage had let Velvet perform each song multiple times, making sure she had the best possible recording for each. Once her performance was completed, my charcoal-coated companion had been exhausted and had taken her leave of us to take a nap. Amage had been gushing about the performance and the new music since. Thankfully, I felt no repeat pangs of jealousy at this. I was, in fact, rather in awe myself. Amage and I had spent over an hour just reliving the performance like a couple of fan fillies after a concert. The first song had been a long Stable 2 favorite. If I was to attribute to her a theme song, it would have been that one. And the second, also a popular one from her days in the Stable. The third was her rendition of a song she had once told me was originally performed by Pinkie Pie in the original DJ Pony at Hoofbeats, something she had chosen especially for DJ Pony. It was the song she had started to sing a Shattered Hoof, and I was thrilled to finally hear it to completion. The effect on homage was thrilling. I loved seeing the little gray unicorn squee. The final number had been one I had Squee. heard Velvet Remedy constructing during our travels. Squee. The one she had once claimed was about me. I couldn't decide if I wanted to melt or to hide. We had reached the edge of a mezzanine staring down at the lower floor of Ten Pony Mall, filled with classy shops, including one just for wine and another across from it that had been just for cheese, but that was now closed. As we approached the stairs down, I stopped at the site below. Steelhoofs was trotting about, peering into storefront windows and taking in displays of art, casual as you please. All around him, ponies were stopping and staring, some shying away. I saw a mother pull her curious filly behind her protectively. Your friend is causing quite a stir, Homage noted. I chuckled. I guess the high society of ten ponies isn't used to seeing a pony in magical power armor. I wondered if his armored hooves were scuffing their pretentiously polished marble floor. Well, he is a steel ranger. That gives most ponies pause. This was not the first time I had heard some pony I trusted suggest the steel rangers had less than a sterling reputation. Why is that? Amwaj looked at me with surprise. You're traveling with a steel ranger, she said slowly, and you don't know anything about them. I opened my muzzle to say that I knew that they were... What? I knew them from the posters, but those were two hundred years old. Truth was, I didn't know the Steel Rangers. I knew Steel Hooves. At least more than my companions knew the enigmatic pony, completely concealed by his armor. I'd seen a memory orb. One of a memory I'd assumed, with reason, was his. No, I suppose I really don't. Tell me. Amos guided us away from the stairs and towards a table at a small but expensive eatery. A waitress pony brought us menus the moment we sat down, managing to look haughty as if her customers were beneath her. Looking at the menu, I once again discovered that everything on it was a fancified version of pre-war food. I shook my head, pushing the menu aside. Fifty bottle caps for a banana puree that I can find in the refrigerator of a ruined building for free? No thanks. Frying it into strips and weaving it to look like a basket isn't worth that much. Amaj lifted an eyebrow. Try to remember that most ponies here wouldn't last a day on the outside. They are raiders, slavers, renegade security robots, and even a few stray matacors between them and their free food. 
She looked around at the other patrons, then leaned forward and whispered, Honestly, I don't think many of these ponies could handle rad roaches. They'd stomp one and then the other rad roaches would kill them while they're trying to scrape the rad roach gunk from their hooves in an uncontrolled disgust. I looked around at the elite mares and gentle stallions of Ten Pony. She was probably right. The stockpiles from Ten Pony Tower itself ran out generations ago. What they sell now has been acquired from scavenger ponies, specialists in plumbing the ruins of Manhattan for foodstuffs. Fortunately, there were food shops, restaurants, and grocery stores galore in the city before the bomb. So, scavenging has been fruitful as it is dangerous. But scavenger ponies don't risk their necks for cheap. And, with how irradiated all the water is, it's hard for a pony family to purify enough for a tiny garden. For a restaurant like this, fresh crops are out of the question. I considered that, then picked up the menu again. I ordered the fried banana puree basket and a bottle of wine. It was surprisingly full of flavor. The steel rangers, homage explained over our glasses of wine, are the old guard of the Ministry of Wartime Technology. They see themselves as the knights of the greatness of the past, which they consider to be tied to Equestria's advancements in technology and industry, and as custodians of the technology that their ministry helped create. Honestly, most of them would be more interested in saving your pit buck than saving you. After lunch, I treated homage to an early evening at the spa. The last time had been so utterly delightful that I had to share the experience with her. Amwich had asked that the small radio in the spa be turned to DJ Pony Station. From the expression the spa ponies gave her, they didn't much approve of the ghoul-loving renegade, but were used to this request. With the new music playing, I suspected that the broadcast's popularity was peaking. One of the pretty spa ponies was dabbing my face with cleansing and revitalizing mud when the voice of DJ Pony blasted out of the little radio. Good evening, children. I looked to Amwich in surprise. She winked back before they covered her eyes with the slices of cucumber. Got a question for all you faithful listeners out there. Have any of you mares or bucks ever seen a ghost? Now, DJ Pony, I hear you say, there's no such things as ghosts. Been ghost stories about Maine Hatton ever since my grandmother's grandmother was a filly, and no ponies ever actually seen one. Ghost stories are all made up, you know? Well... Now what if I, DJ Pony, your voice in the wasteland, were to tell you that I have seen a ghost? And I don't mean heroic stable dwellers who miraculously survive falling off cliffs and trains. Not this time. I groaned aloud. I would have clenched my eyes, but they were already being covered with vegetables. Now, it was several years ago, and I had just gotten myself out of a tight spot with one of those manicures, so I was riding Dash and Stampede at the time. But she was there, Celestia's honest truth. Never seen her again or found the exact spot I'd stumbled onto. But there are more crazy things in the wild wasteland than you believe. Later, as the spa ponies gave us a pony petty and horn treatment, I asked Homage, What is Stampede? Oh, it's a mixture of rage and painkillers, Homage answered. A friend and I found the recipe in the ruins of an MOP clinic when we were younger. My curiosity took hold. A friend? Will I get to meet her? No. I'm afraid my friend didn't survive the efforts to get us into Ten Pony Tower. I felt amazingly refreshed and relaxed. Our time in the spa had been pleasant and intimate, and I had high hopes for the rest of the evening. As we stepped out of the spa, Amage leaned close and whispered, Had that last bit pre-recorded. It's a good idea to be seen in public occasionally while DJ Pony is live on the radio. I nodded, staring at her just a little. The mud bath had been the first time I had seen her wearing either a dress nor a spa robe. Her cutie mark looked like it could be either a speaker or a megaphone. Either way, it was perfectly appropriate to her. And I could see why she chose to keep it private through dressing finely. If anyone suspected she was more than just DJ Pony's errand filly, the cutie mark was all but a dead giveaway. Three little ponies galloped up to us, two colts and a younger filly. The youngest had tears in their eyes, the colt trying to hold his back while the filly was blinking hers away with a hopeful expression. I heard Homage moan at their approach. Oh. Miss Homage, the oldest one called as they drew close. DJ Pony says that Daddy tried to rob the heroine of the wasteland, and that's why he's in jail. Is it true? He's wandering. Did he really do that? Daddy would. Oh, fuck me with the moon. Moon, sun, both of them. Rape me hard. (laughs) Amage looked, if anything, even less comfortable. But she stood by the truth. Yes, children, I'm afraid he did. But he's really sorry. 
I interjected, even though I knew the only thing Monterey Jack was actually sorry about was that I had put him in a bad place. And I'm sure they'll let him go. I... I paused, wincing as I chose my words, speaking more slowly. I know the stable dweller is really upset about seeing him in jail. Will she save him? The filly blurted out with so much hope in her voice it nearly knocked me over. Why would she do that? Her eldest brother retorted. He threatened her and tried to rob her. I looked to homage helplessly. They ain't gonna let him go, said the middle brother. They're gonna hang him in two days. I paced back and forth in the Athenium as homage watched me sadly. You can't interfere. Oh, yes, I can. Homage gave a melancholy sigh. I understand why you feel you should, even if he did lay in his own hay. But from what you said, it really doesn't sound like he wants to be helped. I snorted. Then I'm not going to leave it up to him. He has three children that need looking after. They need to come before his twisted up code of honor. Little Pip, Amage whispered. We've just met. Oh, I don't want to lose you already. I stopped, shocked. Lose me? In exasperation, Amage pointed out. If you do anything, and survive the guards with their battle saddles, you and your friends will never be allowed to set hoof in Ten Pony Tower again. I turned and looked her in the eyes. They were glistening, ready to cry. Don't do this. I'll be with you. Always. Pretty much wherever you go. Just tune into DJ Pony and I'll be there. But you won't be able to be with me. I fell back on my haunches as the dead weight of what I would be sacrificing descended fully upon me. Night was falling as I walked slowly along the celestial line. Velvet Remedy and Steel Hooves walked in line behind me. Calamity was flying scout. All I had told the others was that I was going for a walk. Every one of them insisted on coming with me. Only Velvet Remedy asked if there was a reason why, and she did so in private. She could tell I was distressed, and she was alarmed that I was not spending the evening with homage. Calamity, I think, was looking for an excuse to stretch his wings. Steel Hooves simply fell in behind me without comment. I felt like he would go anywhere I did, and I still had no idea why. Truth was, as much as I wanted to spend the night with homage, I was too messed up inside to enjoy it. I needed fresh air. I needed to clear my head. I needed a distraction. Fortunately, the Grey Unicorn had not only understood, but had encouraged me. Velvet Remedy's horn provided light. I didn't even need the one from my pit buck. The quiet of the night wrapped us like a blanket punctured by the occasional distant screams or gunshots. Each time Calamity swooped away to investigate. Sometimes he would come back with reports of scavengers fighting off wild animals. Ah. Most of the time, he returned no Sorry, larger than before. Once, his disappearance was followed by several little thundercracks. I knew the sound of his battle saddle by heart. I heard no return fire, but we all stopped and waited and worried all the same. It took him a quarter of an hour to return, and when he did so, he was laden with sacks of pilfered goods. Raider nest. Bunch of earth pony raiders with spears and sledgehammers, he explained with a grin. No pony expects a pegasus. He landed and passed me a sack full of metal apples. They didn't have any ammo either, but they had these. Steelhoofs offered to take the grenades. Of the lot of us, he was the only one who actually had any skill with the things. One of these days, we gotta get you something that don't do no splash damage. Calamity passed another splash sack, damage. this one holding a square box with beveled edges inside. I like how he described splash damage. Medical kit they uh, had was locked, so I just brung the whole thing. Brought, Velvet corrected as she took the sack. That's what I said. Velvet rolled her eyes to me before slinging the sack over her, clasping it by her saddlebag harness. There was no rush in opening it. I could pick the lock when we reached our next four-star station. Presence delivered. Calamity flew ahead again. The next four-star station it? was the site of a massacre. Now I'm curious. I Open watched Sealhoves tread between the bodies of over thirty ghouls. Most of them looked like they had been mowed down by heavy minigun fire. Powerful explosions had torn holes in the walls of the station and the homes that had been built into and around it. The place was rank with the wet smell of ghoul corpses. The buzzing of flies was a constant drone that reminded me of the high whine of Stable 2's lights. Velvet Remedy had fled up the line about 300 yards, unable to stomach this. Calamity was looting the bodies. Rotting Tail's group, 
Stilo was finally announced, long after I had come into the same realization. He kept his deep voice neutral. I wish I could see his expression behind the mask. Steelhoofs? I asked cautiously. Are you all right? Why wouldn't I be? He asked, again keeping his voice neutral. Too neutral. He was refraining from something. Whether it was laughing in joy or raging in offense, I couldn't guess. How about you? You're not indulging in the looting, I notice. As Calamity would say, it's not like these creatures are using anything here anymore. Might as well go to our use. To Steel Hooves, looting ghouls was okay, but looting Steel Rangers was not? I didn't like that. Although, with consideration, I had to admit to myself that I would probably react considerably worse towards the looting of the bodies of stable dwellers. I'm going to burn them, I announced. As soon as Calamity's done with the scavenging. If you want, you should join him in that. Interesting, Steel Hooves intoned, but remained with me. I found his reaction to my reaction as interesting as he apparently found my reaction to be. As morbid and repulsive as the setting was, I decided to attempt to fathom our new friend. I heard about the Steel Rangers. They don't exactly have a heroic reputation. Is that how you see yourself? He replied. You're a hero? I flinched, but quickly suspected he was deflecting. How about you? How do you see yourself? As a traditionalist. Okay, what the hell did that mean? What? I tried again. I don't even know what that means. I'm told that most Steel Rangers are more interested in saving technology than saving ponies. How about you? Steel Hoves was quiet. I pressed. Are you following us around to keep my pit buck safe? Steel Hoves snorted a laugh. Then, somberly, he revealed a little of himself. Steel Rangers, each and every one, swears the same oath. But there is some divergence of opinion as to whether our fealty is owed to the mayor of the ministry or to the ministry itself. He spoke of the ministry as if there was only one, or at least only one of any importance. Are they that different? I asked. But Calamity returned before I could get an answer, and Steelhoofs was not willing to share with an audience. I think I get everything we might want. You have a strong back for a pegasus, Steelhoof ribbed. Are you sure you don't want to get the furniture as well? Calamity grunted, flapping his wings. Ignoring the jime from Steelhoof's comment, I considered the underlying truth. Calamity, why don't you fly back and unload that stuff back at the suite? You can catch up with us. We'll still be on the Celestia line. Calamity smiled, tipping back his hat. We'll do. Then he was off. I focused, the bodies of the ghouls wrapped in light one by one. I levitated them into a pile. Then, walking out ahead of one of the monorails with steel hose following on the other, I reached a safe distance. I turned, floating up the zebra rifle, and sent half a clip into the mound of ghoul cadavers. The pile began to burn. We watched Velvet Remedy, who was staring at the ghoulish pyre with strange fascination. I looked back, trying to figure out why the sight held her gaze so. A balefire phoenix was circling the bonfire of corpses. Repeating message. Again, this is Blackwing of Blackwing's Talons, sending out a distress call on every friendly frequency. Please send this message on to any Talon companies in the area. My team and I are trapped on the roof of Horseshoe Tower by enemy forces. We are low on ammo and cannot hold out much longer. Oh no, here come more of them! The radio message ended abruptly, then looped, repeating the words of the female griffin. She sounded younger than God, and not quite as hard. My pit buck had started receiving the distress signal over a mile away from Horseshoe Tower. The signal was weak, but Horseshoe Tower had been one of the tallest buildings in all of Equestria, and was the largest skyscraper remaining in Manhattan ruins, easily dwarfing Tenpony by over double its height. To anyone receiving this message, this is Blackwing of Blackwing's Talons. Please, we need help. We're pinned on the roof of the Horseshoe Tower by overwhelming enemy forces. We're low on ammo and food, and we've lost three of our team already. We are in desperate need of assistance. If anyone can hear this message, please bring help. Please hurry, we can't hold out much longer. This is a repeating message. Again, this is Blackwing. I removed my ear bloom and played the recording aloud as we got within a few blocks. I had hoped Calamity would catch up with us before we reached the skyscraper's four-star station, but I wasn't willing to wait. Each loop of the message pressed upon me with mounting sense of urgency. We're going in, I announced. Then, reconsidering my words, I'm going in. You two can stay behind if you want. I understand. I swished my tail. 
Besides, some pony should let Calamity know where we are. Steelhose nickered. Personally, I look forward to the chance to meet those noble ghoul slayers. He looked at me. And you're going because? Are you being the heroine? You enjoy risking your life for strangers? Or is there something else about Horseshoe Tower? I glared at my companion, then smirked. Oh, I just want to know how a bunch of griffins could get trapped on the roof of a building. Steelhoves chuckled. I turned to Velvet Remedy. You are not going it alone, Velvet insisted with a grim smile and a stomp. And we can leave Calamity a note. She paused. He can read, can't he? I rolled my eyes. Yes, and you know it. Then, considering the idea, I found myself at a loss. I still had the clipboard and pencil that I had taken from the Ten Pony Tower Constabulary, but a note left under a chunk of crumbled concrete would easily be missed. For Calamity to see it, we'd need to paint the message in big letters on the roof of the station. And even then, he would miss it if we didn't illuminate it somehow. I pointed these problems out to Velvet Remedy. In case you missed the light show earlier, dear, illumination will not be a problem. Velvet smiled wryly. I can cast a spell on the letters that will make them quite eye-catching. Can you just make glowing words? Velvet Remedy shook her head. Yes, but only if I stayed here to maintain them. To leave them behind, I would have to enchant existing writing. Paint, preferably, unless we can find a really big ink pot. Steelhoves whinnied as he trotted past us to the station's double doors that led into Horseshoe Tower. Then we'll paint it in the blood of the first enemy we encounter. He turned and bucked the doors hard enough to not only swing them open, but send one flying across the waiting room inside. I cringed and thanked the goddesses that the room wasn't full of enemies. Are you coming? I heard Velvet Remedy step over the body of the griffin, his bulk nearly doubled by the twin minigun battle saddle that was still strapped to his corpse. It was the first body that we had encountered, which wasn't centuries old. The floor was littered with bullet casings, making walking around it treacherous. I couldn't tell what killed him. That worried me. It worried me even more when Velvet Remedy diagnosed it as natural causes, her voice loaded with disbelief. At least we know they came this way, Steelhoves observed. I was beginning to worry that there was no way up. Much of Horseshoe Tower's interiors had collapsed. Stairwells had crumbled. Hallways had caved in. The entire building had become a maze, forcing us to weave in and out of rooms in order to make it from one end of a hallway to the other, Is making us really go down a floor to find stairs that would take us up too. Ahead, we heard the spray of water. My pit buck started click-clicking softly. The only way to get to the next set of stairs was through a collapsed section of wall between two bathrooms. The building's water talisman was still pumping water through the shattered pipes. The water was alive with low levels of radiation. The balefire bomb had probably irradiated the talisman itself. I checked with Velvet Remedy, making sure we had enough rat away with us. The radioactive shower would be minor, nothing worth getting concerned about. But if this was a sign of bigger problems ahead, I wanted to make sure that we were prepared. Holding my breath, I pushed myself through the spray as quickly as I could. I stumbled a little as the wet floorboards on the other side gave an inch. Okie dokie loki. Steelhoofs, I'll be floating you through and setting you down over there, I said, pointing at the far corner of the room near the doorway out. This floor is not stable. Velvet Remedy stayed back. I focused on Steelhoofs, wrapping him in a telekinetic blanket. Slowly, I lifted the heavy steel ranger up half a yard and brought him through the shower. I took a single step back, feeling the floor wobble alarmingly once again, and glided him past me towards a corner that I was fairly certain would be dry and stable. Steelhoofs made it halfway there when something he saw through the open doorway caused him to thrash, trying to find purchase on the floor. Before I could put him down, before I could even ask what he saw, the alicorn stepped into the doorway. My levitation magic imploded as I gasped in shock. Steelhoofs dropped hard, turning to fire at the alicorn, and the floor gave way beneath him. Steelhoofs dropped out of sight. I heard splashes beneath. The alicorn took a step forward, looking down at the hole, and the rest of the floor collapsed. The alicorn Super tried to thrust out her wings to fly, but they struck the sides of the doorframe and she Super fell into the floor below with him. I found myself standing on a wet, sagging plank jutting out over the floor below like a diving board, which was appropriate since the floor below was a swimming pool. My pit buck started click-click-clicking with great enthusiasm. Scrambling on the floating debris, the alicorn thrashed, 
her horn beginning to glow. Steel hooves was nowhere in sight, having surely sunk to the bottom. I wished for the bag of grenades. I had to act fast, but my mind wasn't thinking fast enough. The alicorn would have her shield up before I figured out what to do. Kablam! An explosion right next to my head blew out my eardrums. The world became a strained high buzz. I immediately lost all sense of balance, tumbling from my position. Dude. I landed on a floating chunk of flooring, then immediately began to capsize. I grasped the chunk of floor telekinetically, letting out a scream I could feel but not hear. Focusing had become excruciating. In front of me, I saw the alicorn floating in debris and blood. Velvet Remedy had blown a large chunk of the creature's neck away with the shotgun. It wasn't dead, but it was a race between blood loss and drowning as to which would finish her off first. I watched in horror as it began to heal, the wound slowly closing. They fucking regenerate? That what? was not fair. It was not okay. With a flash of anger, I started telekinetically grasping jagged floating bits of floor and jabbing at the alicorn's neck until I had crudely sawed it off. The creature began to sink beneath the reddened radioactive water. Velvet Remedy crouched over me, her horn pointing at my left ear. She'd already restored hearing to my right. Seal hooves stood next to us at the edge of the swimming pool, dripping with water that was making my pit buck clickety click wildly. He was arguing with Velvet over how much Radaway he needed to drink. Velvet was leaning towards every last packet we had. Steelhoofs was insisting he didn't need any at all. My left ear began to mend. We don't have time for this. Steelhoof stomped, cracking the tiles under his armored hoof. Those creatures always travel in groups. Then take the Radaway and stop being a baby. My shotgun surgeon spat back, glowering. Seriously, do all of my patients have to be so difficult? I wanted to point out that I was laying there being very non-difficult, thank you very much. Steelhose bristled at that. Finally, I spoke up. Steelhose, tell her. Both of them turned to stare at me. Or, at least, I assumed Steelhose was staring at me. His visor was pointed in my direction. Tell me what? Velvet asked slowly. Then, turning to Steelhose, tell me what? Steelhose was silent. I sighed. Look, if I was able to figure it out, so will she. She's smarter than I am. I could tell Velvet Remedy was forcing herself not to react to the compliment. Steelhose finally relented. I'm a ghoul. Velvet Remedy, to her credit, didn't take a step back. Didn't even gasp. She was just strangely quiet for a while. Long enough that I would have worried I had lost my hearing again if it wasn't for the drip, drip, drip on the tiles underneath the Steel Ranger. Radiation is... regenerative for ghouls, Steelhoves admitted. I was more in danger of drowning. In truth, there had been little danger of that with the rebreather in his magically powered armor. Of course, I realized, feeling slow and stupid, the alicorn was regenerating because she was in the pool. Radiation must affect them the same way. Huh. I would well, never then, guess that Steelhoofs I guess you won't cool. need the rat away. Velvet Remedy concluded casually, slipping the packs back into one of the boxes. I was actually thinking he was boxes. a cool hater. Knowing I was by far the most capable of stealth, I determined that I should scout ahead. I spotted the alicorn's two sisters in the room on the next floor. Their tails were to me, oblivious to my presence as they seemed to be focusing on magically trying to rip the door of a safe off its hinges. Their coats were a deep purple, almost black. So how does a ghoul get into steel rangers? They have no cutie marks. I slipped my sniper rifle out and slid into the zen of sats. Blam. The first alicorn went down hard, Blaine blasting out the front of her skull to paint the safe she'd been so focused on. The second began to turn, her shield already starting to form. But I was faster and these creatures were not that much tougher than the rest of us if caught unawares and without the protective spells cast. Blam. I slipped out of sats as the second alicorn's body slumped to the floor. I looked at the safe, the splatter of blood, brains, and bone reminding me that we never did go back and paint that note for Calamity. Wait. Stop. I'm looking at the gore from some pony, or at least some thing, that I have just murdered. And I'm thinking that... Am I really becoming that callous to the horrors and violence of the equestrian wasteland? 
I wondered where this would fit on Monray Jack's slide of loss of self. I also wondered what the hell the alicorns had been after. So I trotted up to pick the lock. The safe, however, refused to be unlocked. After examination and struggling, I realized that it wasn't jammed or broken by the alicorns. I just wasn't good enough. Well, I knew how to fix that. No. I found myself smiling as the party time Mintow washed me clean of all the stupidity and dullness that was holding me back. Don't. No. I took a deep breath of relief. No. Finally, I was the real me again. My smile faded as I turned to see Velvet Remedy watching me sadly. Three more alicorns stood on the other side of a gaping divide. At least five internal floors had collapsed, leaving a honeycomb of half-rooms ringing a massive pit. Motes of debris and ash floated in the void between us. Steelhoofs opened fire with his grenade machine gun, taking out one of them, and all the rooms around her, before she could fully erect her shield. The others launched themselves into the air, spreading their wings as their shield bubbled around them. I gave a prayer to Luna and floated out a memory orb, making sure it was the one of Pinkie Pie's last party, and not the one I had retrieved from the safe seven floors below. I began levitating the orb towards the closer of the two of them. The alicorn let out a wicked, bitter, and majestic laugh that echoed off the walls of the pit. Using telekinesis of her own, she knocked it free of my telekinetic sheath with a hurled chair. The orb containing the memory of Pinkie Pie's last party plunged into the depths below, bounced, rolled, and disappeared through a crack, lost forever. The dark purple-coated alicorn's voice rumbled with undeniable superiority. Do you think we are fools? We remember how you killed us before. Oh, we were so fucked. Run! I yelled, turning tail and racing towards the stairs. Velvet Remedy and Steelhoofs galloped after me, Wait, overtaking me were... as I charged up and out of the stairwell into a hallway. Turning, I ordered Steelhoofs to collapse the entrance behind us. His grenade machine gun was useless against the shielded alicorn, but it was more than a match for the crumbling structure we were in. Concrete and wood rained down in a thunderous cloud of dust. What happened? Steelhoofs demanded. Panting, I explained. There's some sort of telepathy involved. My fears had been proven true. Not just between the ones that are together. All of them. Every time we kill one, they learn from it. I wouldn't be able to trick them the same way twice. Our ploy bought us time, but not much. I could hear them on the other side, clearing a path to us. With a flash of light, one of the alicorns appeared right between us. They can teleport too? Velvet Remedy blurted, finally reaching the same level of hateful disbelief I felt towards the creatures. The Seriously, alicorn herself seemed a little surprising. surprised. Apparently, teleporting into some place you can't see was a tricky work, even this is for these the weirdest creatures. Episode. No, no, I, I didn't think she expected right. to be this close. But seriously, this is... Too bad she hadn't appeared a yard to either side, stuck herself in a wall. But no, we couldn't be that lucky. Or could we? I realized something very peculiar. The alicorn's sphere of shielding was up at full strength, but she appeared literally in the center of us. Part of each of us were inside of the barrier including Steelhoof's metal rear end. The alicorn began casting a spell. I felt a vice tighten around my heart. My hooves began to tingle. A heart attack spell? Feeling panic well up inside me as my heart struggled to beat, I suddenly knew how these creatures had killed the griffins through natural causes. Move! I yelled as I telekinetically grasped the sack of grenades. Steelhoof's dashed forward, leaving the grenades inside the sack. Without opening it to reveal the contents, I focused and tried to pull as many of the pins as I could. Unfortunately, moving objects I couldn't directly see was as difficult for me as teleporting into an unknown space was for an alicorn. I only managed to pull the pins on three before I backed out of the shield. The alicorn looked questioningly down at the sack as it fell to her feet. Her shield contained the explosion quite effectively. It was a gory and brilliant sight. Well, that would explain how griffins can get trapped on a roof, I said flatly. We had to fight our way through four more of the creatures before we made it to the roof. The combination of my stealth and the steel hose massive firepower kept us alive, but it was getting harder. They were all alert for us now, and seemed to be coordinating their defenses. We had to run any time they got their spells up, and we were not fast enough to take out more than two before the others were able to cast their shields. On the roof were four more alicorns. 
They were sitting, frozen at the four corners of the building, their attentions focused inward. Instead of surrounding themselves with a sphere of protective magic, they were cooperatively maintaining a hemisphere of magical force that was keeping the three griffin mercs encaged. New one to me, Seal was muttered from beside me. Oh, thank the great egg, one of them blurted out, seeing us through the glowing shell of force that trapped her and the other two surviving griffins. She stopped. Where are the rest of you? I looked around. Velvet Remedy and Steelhose were flanking me. The goddesses only knew where Calamity was. I suspected he was circling the Celestial Line, hoping to spot us. I winced at the thought and hoped he wasn't too worried. I could see the faintest suggestion of approaching dawn on the skyline. A chill wind blew up my mane, bringing the salty smell of the harbor. It was almost a shame that we'd reached the roof in the dark of night. The view in the daytime must be amazing. Then again, the view could also paralyze me with ah. vertigo. So, probably Sorry. better that we were here now after all. Turning back to the three griffins. This is it. Just us. Well, this isn't much of a rescue, one of the griffins said bitterly. Gratitude. Look it up. I turned away and looked over the alicorns. They were statuesque in their concentration. I wasn't even sure they realized we were on the roof with them. And they were outside the shield they were creating. If we could take the three of them down with a coordinated attack, surely the griffins could take out the last one. What kind of firepower do you guys still have? I could hear Steelhoof's whistle as the griffin in the back stepped forward. She was wearing what looked like magically powered armor of her own, a griffin design. Nowhere near as complicated or as encompassing as steel hooves, leaving her talons, legs, and wings bare, as well as most of her face, with a huge, tri-barreled, biggest battle satellite I had ever seen. Dismounted AA cannon, steel hooves said appreciatively. I had no idea what that meant, but this looked like the non-magical energy version of the plasma cannon that Calamity had used against the dragon. Well, we definitely had the firepower. Only five shots left, the griffin said glumly. Still, five shots from that thing should be more than enough. And there are four wings of these horny bastards on their way, the first griffin announced. From her voice, I finally identified her as Blackwing. I noted mentally that I would not have chosen the word horny to describe the alicorns, unless Blackwing knew something I did not. Four wings? I asked. You mean two more? No, Steelhoofs interjected. She means twelve. Oh, well, moon rocks. Made sense. A wing, then, must be a group of three. Explains why there were three of them hunting steel hooves outside Fetlock. These four have just been keeping us pinned here while their reinforcements arrive, Blackwing informed us. Wait. I perked up. We're okay, then. I'm pretty sure we took them out on the way up. I mentally counted. One in the pool, two in the safe three in the pit. One of those had lived and joined up with three more, so we'd killed... nine. There were still three left. Somehow we'd managed to go right past a whole wing of alicorns without either party realizing it. And they would probably be bursting into the roof in any minute. We had to work fast. I quickly laid out the plan and everyone started taking their positions. As they alicorns. did so, I couldn't help but voice my suspicions to Blackwing. What is it that you mercenaries were after in this place that these creatures want so badly? Codes to crack a safe in the Ministry of Image on Ministry Walk, Blackwing said, surprisingly forthcoming. Safe contains an artifact that our employer would really like the possession of. Turns out the goddess these monsters serve wants it too. What kind of artifact? I asked, as I levitated out little Macintosh and checked the load. I was going to use a magic bullet for this, just to be sure. The Black Book. Well, the Black Book of something or other. A tome with some of the foulest zebra magics. Stuff that could tear a pony's soul apart, they say. Or raise spirits from the grave. Necromancy. The very thought that such spells and powers actually existed gave me nightmarish chills. To my knowledge, no pony had ever used such dark arts. It was horrifying to imagine that the zebras actually could. Necromancy wasn't even supposed to be real, just a horror story to scare young fillies at slumber parties. It was the sort of foulness that the Ministry of Image was casting their nets to catch. The purging of books took on a whole new and terrifying light. 
I began to wonder if the purpose behind the confiscation of ideologically incompatible books wasn't at least, in part, a smokescreen for this. Because by the goddesses, you couldn't tell the public that the zebras had necromancy, much less that books on the stuff were slipping into Equestria. The notion of zebra necromancy breathed an uncomfortable new dimension into how being on the fringe of a megaspell event turned ponies into ghoul ponies and zombie ponies. While I was talking to Blackwing and pondering the implications of the Black Book, Steelhoves and Velvet Remedy were discussing our foes. I caught the end of the conversation. Don't all have the same spells. Only the deep purple-coated ones like the wings below can teleport, Steelhoves explained to her. The midnight blue coats. Invisibility, Velvet Remedy interjected. Oh yes, I remember. The dark green ones. I haven't seen them do anything the others can't do. Steelhose walked up close to one of the statue-like alicorns and took a close look at its coat, a forest green so deep it was nearly black. Until now. Butcher, the griffin with the heavy gun, stood at the ready in front of the farthest alicorn. Steelhose had locked onto the one on my left. Velvet Remedy had her, formerly my, combat shotgun hovering an inch from the temple of the one on my right. I floated little Macintosh between the eyes of the one in front of me. On the count of three. One... Two. In a thunderous crash of gunshot and explosions, three alicorns went down. So did the shield. The last alicorn immediately sprang to life, alert, and... The griffin's supergun let out a boom that could be heard on the moon. The fourth alicorn simply was no more. Blackwing swooped forward and took me in his talons as the other lightly encumbered griffin scooped up velvet, taking off into the air. I threw a telekinetic sheath around Steelhose, carrying him with us. The last griffin took off, circling to cover our tail. We were a few blocks away when the last three alicorns burst onto the roof. Part of me wanted to laugh tauntingly. Then they reminded us that they could fly too. And, unencumbered, they were much faster and much more maneuverable. Wrapping themselves in magical shields, they swooped to close the distance. I closed my eyes, trying to force my PTM-enhanced brain to think of something. For the first time, party-time mintiles were failing me. Well now, y'all look like you can use some help. Only once before had I ever been so happy to hear Calamity's voice, and that was when I was facing a dragon. I opened my eyes, staring to him thankfully. I hope you have a plan, cause I've got nothing. Y'all just follow me. Calamity smiled and shot out ahead of us, dropping altitude. Turns out, the one direction that heavily laden griffins could fly even faster than alicorns was down. They gave chase, but we were pulling ahead. Unless we're diving for a mattress factory, Blackwing squawked. This'll be a really short trip. I glanced back. There was a good distance between us and the three creatures, now only visible as glowing bubbles of sickly green energy that zipped through the sky towards us. Stop pulling up now, Calamity called back. Does he have any idea, the griffin carrying Velvet Remedy grunted, how hard it is to pull up at this speed carrying this much weight? I could see the street coming up fast as we began to level. I smiled, thinking of just how much junk Calamity had a habit of scavenging. I had no doubt that the answer was yes. Calamity's the three order. griffins finally pulled straight with only yards to spare skimming over the tops of the taller wagons. I felt a hoof drag along the top of a passenger wagon. The alicorns were beginning to close the gap. Lightning ripped from the one of their horns, shooting past us. Up ahead, the street ended in a massive parking lot. Rows upon rows of delivery wagons were lined up before a long building. With the exceptional visual clarity provided by Party Time Mint House, I was able to make out a logo on the roof of the building as we approached it. A filled-in black Omega symbol with a white earth pony seeming to levitate the package on her back. I suddenly realized the plan, and I blinked before Calamity started shooting. I turned on my eyes forward sparkle, making a quick scan for life down there. I only had a moment, but at least I had party time mintiles boosting my keenness and judgment. All I was seeing were red blips scurrying about below. Probably rad roaches. I could hear a series of pops as we shot past the delivery wagons and over the rooftop. The alicorns were just breaching the parking lot, moving too fast to stop when the first delivery wagons exploded like megaspell bombs in extreme miniature. The first explosions instantly set off the rest, 
and three city blocks erupted in a vibrant cascade of insanely colored light. Their shields couldn't protect them against that. The blast of radiation couldn't heal them from a force that ripped them apart beneath a cellular level. They could not even mentally scream. There was no time. The three alicorns were simply gone. The building shielded us just enough to save us before it was vaporized. My pit buck screamed as we were hit by a wash of heat and radiation. My EFS flashed a red warning that I was suffering radiation poisoning before it collapsed altogether, my pit buck crashing. A moment later, we crashed too. Well then, that was the weirdest, that was a very interesting chapter. Um, I don't know what to say about this other than, wow, this is a lot to take in. And, um, here, let me, uh, do something about this. Um, no, not, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, go back. Um, wow. Well, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Fallout Equestria because the story started giving me, giving me more, again, more questions than answers. And it continues to do that. That's, that's, that's what I like about stories when it starts giving me more questions than answers and makes me want to know the answers. Oh, God. Sorry, guys. I kind of, well, I'm getting a little sleep lately. Well, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And before we go, I'd like to remind you guys that if you haven't seen my previous um, Fallout Equestria video, but I'd like to remind you guys that soon I will be married to this woman. And that's in like 37 days I will be married to that woman. And the wedding will be three days after. So after we uh, sign our marriage certificate and everything. Also, um... Uh, these next few days I'll be cooking, so there might be uh, some days I might not be uh, doing videos. So, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. So, I'll catch you guys later. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye-bye!